back uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, let's start with uh, the eighth session of wealth management for working professionals uh, in the last session we have covered something related to how uh, warren buffett has uh, used his uh, the principles 12 principles which we have discussed uh, on to various you know instruments like uh, equities then debt instrument like bonds Today also we will be covering one or two cases, but we don't, I will not be uh, delving in detail related to the so-called, uh, uh, what uh, that valuation uh, and all. I'll just give a brief idea about what are those cases and uh, what they are up to. Last time we have covered level three communication case study in detail. So this time it is related to Quest. Quest is basically a kind of a company uh, which is uh, headquartered in Denver. Uh, the holding company is known as Quest Corporation. It has a subsidiary company called as Quest Communications, which is a struggling uh, telecommunication uh, company. Uh, and uh, that is in 2002, uh, Berkshire, that is the company of Warren Buffett, they have invested millions of dollars in bonds issued by Quest Communications. At that time, Quest had around 26 billion uh, in debt and uh, they were almost about to file for bankruptcy. That is when uh, the bonds were traded at a discounted rate of 35 to 40 percentage in the market uh, compared to its face value. And uh, whereas uh, the uh, the holding company, which is Quest Corporation, it was almost the same. Uh, similar bonds are operated at a discount of 20 percentage or at the face value of 80 percentage of what they have issued. So these bonds were yielding somewhere around 12.5 percentage. Uh, interest or rather you can in in uh, financial parlance it is called as coupon rate as we have discussed how that name coupon has come so then uh, these are again these assets are backed by specific assets you know that apart from uh, the bond yield they were also backed by specific assets some are riskier some are not whereas uh, warren buffett has purchased both of them then uh, basically many at many most of the analysts they said that you know it was uh, uh, wrong on the part of warren buffett to have purchased uh, quest assets which would you know and uh, whereas buffett had uh, full faith uh, in his own investment uh, assuming that whatever he has invested he will get get back whatever repayment and however he had a lot of faith in uh, the CEO, as always, you know, all our investments are totally backed by the faith of Warren Buffett on the, uh, the, the so-called management or the CEO of the company. So in this case, it is uh, CEO Dick Notbart. Uh, so he, he was very much sure that this fellow will solve whatever the problems the company is facing. So that is the faith uh, Warren Buffett had over his... Uh, the over the managers of those companies where he has invested so uh, this is a natural and this was also a, a kind of a, a good amount of you know a success story where he earned a decent amount of returns when it comes to uh, another case study it is amazon.com which I, I need not introduce about this company which is now into the so-called online e-commerce and they were into merchandise. They deliver or whatever the, the you know uh, products which are being uh, basically uh, put in place in in their website uh, by various vendors. And uh, the customers, customers like us, you know, it's a, they are basically a kind of a demand aggregator, especially for pro merchandise products. So that just like, you know, all uh, you can say Swiggy, all those kind of models where they are into Swiggy is into uh, food. Then uh, you can say Flipkart is again similarly into the so-called merchandise uh, segment. Uh, 
and this is purely a kind of a tech company which uh, generally uh, warren buffett is very averse towards technology not that he don't understand it basically he is not very clear about the cash flows which those companies will be generating otherwise he was not at all used to even in uh, late 90s or early 2000s his office do not have any computer rather they were you know doing all their operations manually with uh, as little as an, uh, you know 11 to 11 to 13 uh, staff they are the people who do entire of the deals so this is uh, about uh, the way he is uh, doing his investments now uh, coming to this particular case study uh, he has invested somewhere around 98.3 million in the year 2002 in Amazon's very high yield uh, bonds, uh, basically why uh, Warren Buffett is interested is he appreciated the managers who generally exhibit integrity and strong values. So he was very having a lot of faith in Jeff Bezos. So he was very appreciative of him and he started sending letters praising him for his decision to account for uh, stock options as an expense. So then they purchased a 17 percentage <clears throat> bond yielding, you know, uh, of uh, Amazon uh, for around 264 million uh, in a 10 percentage senior notes in 1998. And later uh, in the same year, he purchased an additional 60.1 million dollars of convertible bonds. So uh, this is uh, in nutshell and then at that time the price of that particular uh, bond was 60 uh, per uh, 1000 uh, rupee price. A convertible bond is basically priced at $60 for every equity for 1000 rupee bond which is which is uh, yielding somewhere very healthy 11.48 percentage. So uh, this is in nutshell about this particular case study and then uh, many people asked why did he do, why did he purchase it, purchase such kind of a uh, bond. Basically it is extraordinarily cheap and also he had uh, faith on the company that it would thrive and he had more than anything he had a lot of faith on uh, Bezos and uh, he, he always uh, admired him and he was very much sure that it would uh, Amazon would emerge as a mega brand and that is the reason why he invested into uh, such kind of a you know uh, company though uh, the, the say the revenue is uh, huge but uh, it, its prices are very low as well as the margins are so low but however he believed that the company is very efficient and profitable. So this is the rationale behind why he has purchased uh, bonds from Amazon.com. Now there is another concept called as arbitrage. Arbitrage or arbitrage is uh, one of the simplest way in which uh, people or uh, the investors will try to take advantage of uh, all the you know the so-called uh, inefficiencies within the market most often we tend to see uh, you know when we trade in uh, uh, say Indian stock exchanges be it NSE or BSE we see a typical trend where NSE may be quoting uh, wait a minute I'll just uh, take this yeah NSE may be NSE may be quoting I am putting N as NSE and B as BSE. So NSE may be quoting say 200 rupees for a particular share and then BSE is quoting 200.50 the same 50 paise. So the difference between these two is 50 paise is the difference and uh, a person who is very smart he will initially invest into NSE at the rate of 200 per share. If say, suppose we invest 1 crore rupee for uh, 200 shares or uh, to make it very simple, uh, they have, he invested 2 crore rupees. So in nutshell, he has purchased around uh, uh, 1 lakh shares. So 1 lakh into 50 paise. So he straight away got 
fifty thousand as a profit without making any investment, minus whatever, uh, say uh, whatever is the uh, charges you will be paying for uh, intraday trading. So this is what is said to be an arbitrage. Arbitrage is basically uh, a kind of a riskless kind of a you know uh, mechanism whereby uh, people try to uh, int uh, uh, take advantage of the inefficiencies or inconsistencies within the markets at the same time simultaneously. So these kind of transactions are said to be without any capital risk because your investment, whatever you have put, it has come immediately and whatever the profit you get is purely out of, you know, exploiting the inefficiencies within the markets. And whereas this kind of a thing is uh, basically known as riskless arbitrage whereas risky one is on the other hand you have taken hold uh, held uh, that particular amount with you assuming that in time to come you may you can you know uh, take advantage of it uh, so that is in any case uh, it is risky because we don't know whether we we that that particular deal will materialize at at some uh, profit so at times you know we may anticipate a particular price which we may not get at all so there is a risk in such kind of a transaction so you have to be very careful related to arbitrage and uh, the common type of arbitrage is basically a, you know purchase of a stock at discount to some future value. This future value is usually based on corporate merger, liquidation, tender offer or reorganization. The risk and arbitrage confronts in the future announced price of the risk uh, of the stock may not be realized. Suppose you, you are putting some amount say in a particular stock which you are anticipating it will be listed. This company at, at the moment is unlisted and you you got to have a kind of a you know uh, uh, information or you have got an access to some investor or uh, the so called seller who already had some amount of uh, stocks and you are anticipating that you may get some appreciation the moment you enter into the market however that may not materialize if in the ipo if it uh, list at a price lower than that so this has that kind of a risk. So uh, the future value is usually based on corporate merger, liquidation, tender offer or reorganization. The risk an arbitrage confront is that the future price announced of the stock may not be realized. So you Warren Buffett framed four questions, basic question uh, to identify whether such kind of a risk arbitrage opportunities uh, to evaluate whether they are worth investing or not. Number one is how likely is it that the promised event will occur? First, second question, how long will your money will be tied up? First one is the probability of event occurring. Second is uh, uh, how much, how long it is about the time frame of that particular deal to occur. The third one is what chance is there that something better will transpire a competing bid takeover for example like is there any chance of getting a better uh, you know opportunity other than what is being invested into then the fourth question is what will happen if the event does not take place because of antitrust action or financing glitches do you have any alternative if the answer is no, then you can proceed. If it is S, then you need to take, you know, very serious note of it and then better not to enter into it because there is uncertainty in all these kind of a deals and uh, many a times your entire money may be, you know, blocked. Sometimes you may lose uh, miserably. So uh, Warren Buffett had also tried such kind of a deal in 1981 when it came to Arcata Corporation transaction. Like he bought somewhere around 600,000 shares of the company which was going to leverage buyout. Uh, which was uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's kind of an example of this kind of you know 
transaction basically see leverage buyout is nothing but like uh, when you are say purchasing some company so you may not have enough cash or enough uh, funds with you within uh, with you so what you tend to do is you have one option one is through your internal sources once they dry up then what you look forward is for one one is like you'll try for private equity private equity from those people like you know investors like warren buffett who would be interested to put money into and then the second one is taking loans loans from banks so banks will provide some loans for this entire of the transaction so this is called as leverage bio uh, so now let's move on to the next uh, slide next thing is again uh, it's related to arbitrage only however most of arbitragers uh, might anticipate participate in 50 or more deals annually buffett sought only few financial uh, leverage he limited his participation only to deals that were announced and friendly whereas he never speculate about potential takeovers or prospective uh, prospects for green mails so <laughs> Although he never calculated his arbitrage performance over a year, Buffett estimated that Berkshire has averaged an annual return of about 25 percentage pre-tax. Because the arbitrage is often substitute for short-term treasury bills, Buffett's appetite for deals fluctuated with Berkshire's cash level 25 percentage pre-tax return is a very excellent and a decent kind of a return given the fact that on an average uh, you know uh, equities give 15 percentage as a uh, kind of a return so nowadays however uh, he do not engage in arbitrage uh, on a large scale but rather keeps his excess cash in treasuries and other tr short term liquid investments sometimes buffett holds medium term uh, tax exempt bonds as cal uh, ta cash alternatives he realizes that substituting medium term bonds for short term treasury bills he runs the risk of principal loss if he is forced to sell at disadvantage so that is the crux of the matter see you cannot uh, you know uh, take it as an alternative for cash because uh, there is always a risk of uh, a loss of principle so you have to be very careful while dealing with such kind of uh, deals so whenever you you come across such kind of options then you better think uh, twice and keep asking those four questions which I have uh, said in the few, uh, previous slide. Uh, that is, number one is how likely the promised deal or the event will occur. Like it is about likelihood, the probability. If the probability is high, naturally you can take into consideration. Number two, how long uh, the money will be tied up. Like it is about the period of time which the likelihood of uh, such kind of a thing is going to happen and uh, what is the chance that uh, you know there is any better competitive competing bid takeover which may yield even better uh, returns and say so lastly you have to keep questioning what if the event does not take place because of antitrust action or financial glitches or some other reason right so what is the outcome of this so you have to go through all these four principles then only you have to take a call and uh, without this careful thought uh, you know uh, due diligence you cannot take any kind of a decision so be very wary about these kind of uh, decisions. Then next uh, important aspect is most of the uh, more, uh, but because these tax-free bonds offer higher 
after tax returns than treasury bills. Buffett figures that the potential loss is offset by the gain in income. With Berkshire's history, historical success in arbitrage, shareholders might wonder why Buffett strayed from this strategy. Admittedly, but Buffett's investment returns were better than he imagined. But by 1989, arbitrage landscape started changing. Financial excesses bought uh, about by the leveraged buyout market were created in an environment of unbridled enthusiasm. Buffett was not sure when lenders and buyers would come to their senses, but he had acted cautiously when others are giddy. Even before the collapse of UAL buyout in 1989, Buffett was pulling back from arbitrage transactions. Another reason may be the deals of the size that would really make difference to Warren Buffett's very large portfolio simply do not exist. In any case, Berkshire's withdrawal from arbitrage was made easier with the advent of convertible preferred stocks. So this is a very interesting topic and an area which is quite prevalent in even Indian uh, capital markets. So what is a convertible preferred stock and what is a preferred stock? Preferred stock is a kind of a hybrid security that possess the characteristic of both stock and a bond. Bond, usually it is a bond and you can convert it into stock whenever as per your you know choice and convenience and you can you also have a right not to convert it also that is purely up to you how you are viewing it depending on circumstances situations and generally the stock provides investor with current higher current income than common stocks uh, this higher yield protection from downside price risk so whatever the yield which is generated by these uh, convert preferred stocks will will act as a protection against you know uh, downside price risk suppose any investment which is priced say at 100 rupees offering you a convertible bond or convertible uh, preferred stock and then you know the price is decreasing so whatever the higher yield it is generating that will keep you like you know it's a kind of a fixed income bond kind of a thing whereby you need not uh, purchase the deal if it goes below 100 rupees so uh, that will protect you from such kind of a downward price risk uh, and if the common stock declines the higher yield of convertible preferred stock prevents it from falling uh, as low as common share shares because you are already assured of uh, fixed income so you are not badly affected by uh, the dividend yield which you will be getting because of you know the preferred stock in theory convertible stock will mm, fall in price until its current yield approximates the value of non-convertible bond with similar yield so credit and maturity this is it in nutshell this is the equation so uh, a convertible preferred stock also provides the investor with opportunity to participate in the upside potential of common shares say generally you you are uh, this uh, convertible preferred stocks will come at a premium about 20 to 30 percentage if the uh, say the price of that particular common stock keep increasing by more than 20 or 30 percentage that is the time when it is favorable for anybody to purchase and not in the opposite direction if it keeps on falling better to avoid such kind of uh, purchasing such kind of or rather converting into common stock since it is convertible into a common stock when common stock rises the convertible stock will rise as well However, because the convertible uh, stock provides high income and has potential for capital gains, it is priced at a premium to the common stock. This premium is reflected in the rate at which the preferred is convertible into the common stock.
So next slide will give you usually like a typical conversion premium will always be 20 to 30 percentage. So it's always you have to wait uh, up to the common stock to rise by 20 to 30 percentage before you take any decision without losing value for your uh, uh, investment. So if it if it increases even beyond 20 to 30 percentage, that means you are purchasing at a cheaper price than the uh, so value of the common stock. In this way, he invested in high yield bonds. Buffett invested in convertible preferred stock wherever the opportunity presented itself as better than other investments. In fact, indeed, in uh, uh, 1980s and 1990s, he made several uh, uh, investments into convertible preferred stocks like, you know, Salman Brothers, Gillette, USA, uh, Champion International, American Express. And uh, at times, you know, many whenever the companies are being became a target uh, for takeover by, you know, the so-called uh, hostile takeovers. He always acted as a white knight rescuing such uh, companies from hostile uh, invaders or takeovers. So usually it is not that Buffett want to, you know, do any uh, kind of a severe uh, job without taking any advantage. So he always used to do it for a price. So he simply uh, saw the purchases as a good investment with a high potential for profit. At the same time, preferred stock of these companies offered him higher return than it could otherwise, you know, elsewhere. So some of the companies issuing convertible preferred securities were familiar to Buffett. But in other cases, he had no special insight about the business or uh, could he predict with any confidence what is the future cash flows would be. This unpredictability Buffett explains is the reason why uh, Berkshire's investment was convertible preferred issue rather than a common stock. This is the underlying thing. See, whenever uh, you are not very sure about uh, the future cash flows of those companies, you better prefer to go for a um, convertible preferred stock rather than a common stock. So initially you'll 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 have an idea understanding about how the stock is doing later you can take a decision whenever the price appreciates then you can put your investment into you know uh, uh, the such kind of a companies despite the conversion potential the real value of preferred stock in his eye was its fixed income characteristics uh, except for exception, uh, which is called mid-American. Mid this is a multifaceted tra transaction involving convertible preferred and common stock as well as debt. Here Buffett values the convertible um, preferred for fixed income as well as for its future equity stake. So this is the underlying principle. Now let us try to understand what exactly the case study of mid-American uh, Actually, he purchased uh, somewhere around 35.56 million of uh, convertible preferred stocks of mid-American energy holdings company, a Des Moines based uh, gas and electricity utility for approximately around 1.24 billion or 35.05 per share. This is what is the purchase price where he has purchased. It is a mix of both, you know, like uh, the common preferred stock and also the common stock. Uh, sorry, convertible preferred stock and a common stock. And later, two years later, he brought uh, another uh, set of 6.7 uh, million uh, shares of convertible preferred stock for around uh, 402 million. And uh, this brought uh, Berkshire to over 9 percentage voting rights with around 80 percentage economic interest in the mid is mid America. Like he was getting about 80 percentage of the dividend income for from that particular company. Say so if it turns 100 crore and which is which would be given as a dividend. So he was getting 80, 80 percentage of it, like 80 crores was what he was getting as a dividend from that company. Whereas he got the voting rights of 9 percentage uh, over that uh, particular companies because by virtue of having 
you know, 900,000 or 9 lakh shares common stock in that particular company. So uh, another uh, additional three, 300 million was invested by the company's chairman, uh, David Sokol, and again, CEO Walter Scott. So it is these two people, these two gentlemen who had put their own money that made Warren Buffett to put money into this particular thing. And as we discussed in the past, in the last few lectures, uh, he was very much, you know, uh, interested to put money into those companies where which are managed by excellent managers. And he had complete faith over David Sokol and uh, Walter Scott. So actually, uh, the price he has paid, according to certain reports, are 34 uh, uh, US dollars to 48 uh, US dollars per share. So and also later, because he had access to this particular mid uh, American company, which is an energy company, he had access to, you know, which which is going on for acquisition of pipelines since they own uh, gas. So gas is always transported through pipeline. So pipeline will give a very fixed income, uh, which will be cash flows will be very regular. And uh, also the profit margins will be quite high. So he was also willing to invest up to $15 billion into it. And that is how he got, uh, you know, into this business and which uh, gave him a good amount of decent returns. Now, Another, like, because he has been into this particular thing, it led to him investing into a few more companies, like he purchased uh, a Williams company, uh, Kern River Gas Transmission Project, which was which was transporting 850 million cubic feet of gas every, every day for over 935 miles. So he paid uh, 960 million. Assuming uh, uh, with the assumption of uh, debt and also additional 1 billion in capital expenses. So Midwestern also went on to acquire uh, Dinergy, Dinergy's uh, Northern Natural Gas Pipeline later in 2002 uh, for a bargain price of 900 million uh, plus assumption of debt. So both uh, combined together that that acquisition also was made by midwestern mid american so by the end of uh, sorry by early january 2004 berkshire uh, announced that it would uh, put up about 30 percentage of costs or 3 2 billion for natural um, natural gas pipeline tapping alaskan north north slope natural gas reserves that would boost us reserves by 7 percentage so uh, that is what is the capital investment he has made uh, so that, you know, the natural gas pipeline business is thriving. And uh, this particular acquisition or whatever the uh, investment, it led to increase in uh, U.S. reserves by around 7%. And then uh, Midwest Americans chairman Sokol uh, said that without Warren Buffett's help, the investment would have been a strain on mid-American. So he rescued that company uh, and uh, given, infused the capital which it needed uh, to ensure that they do well. And in another transaction, Berkshire, uh, you know, subsidiary MEHC Investment Incorporation bought around $275 million of Williams preferred stock. This preferred stock does not generally vote with common stock in the election of directors. But in this deal, Berkshire gained a right to elect 40%, 20% of mid-Americans board as well as rights of approval over certain important transactions. That he got it as a bonus because the company management felt that it is always better uh, for Warren Buffett to come on board so that he can give his valuable uh, you know, financial and investment insights, which will benefit the company in the long run. So now let's move to the next slide. Uh, later in that same summer, Buffett along with Lehman Brothers provided Williams with one year 
900 million senior loan it is a loan at around over 19 percent is secured by almost all oil and gas assets of barrett resources which williams originally acquired for about 2.8 billion so you just see imagine the kind of a deal and the access he got to those you know assets like with around almost a billion dollar loan backed by resources you know and the loan is uh, at a 19 percentage interest rate which is one of the highest among the market like you can say very very rarely uh, the so called uh, capital markets will give such kind of a, uh, uh, returns uh, and uh, this uh, this he could uh, gain insight into because he has gone for acquisition of convertible preferred stock in the mid american company which is into gas you know gas uh, supply and utilities so uh, that is uh, that is how when you enter into any kind of investment you tend to develop understanding of the entire industry the structure the competitors the the transactions uh, the kind of you know business acquisitions or uh, the opportunities you will be naturally you know getting into all the details if you go through it and uh, it was again reported uh, that buffers uh, buffett's loan was part of 3.4 billion package of cash and credit that williams still an investment grade company investment grade companies are those companies which are very uh, good uh, to acquire especially you know these are all bond ratings where you know these companies tend to float bonds those bonds if they these these uh, companies don't default on such bonds they are said to be investment grade companies any such kind of a uh, company which which defaults on either the so called uh, the capital principal payment principal repayment or interest charges they are said to be junk bonds or uh, you know uh, doubtful you know they are they are said to be uh, uh, at least uh, uh, you can say that uh, investable kind of a bonds companies right so uh, in terms of the deal uh, a tough and laden with conditions and fee that reported uh, Lee could uh, could have put interest rate on the deal at 34 percentage which is humongous by any standard 38 percentage none of the investment will give you such kind of a you know kind of uh, interest rates except for uh, something like you know credit card business where they charge 36 percentage interest rates uh, and then uh, again there is a high risk of default in kind of such kind of a things whereas this is a kind of a business which is pretty secured and they are they are known for you know repayment and they are a very you can say reputed companies still it can be argued that only uh, not only was Buffett helping an investment grade company out of tight spot but also protecting himself from high risk of situation although mid American was not Buffett's uh, only foray into then uh, the then beleaguered industry energy industry it was it, it definitely was a complex multifaceted uh, investment Buffett believed that the company was worth more than its current value in the market. He knew that the management, including Walter Scott and David Sokol, operated with great credibility, integrity, and intelligence. This is the one of the reason, indeed, a major reason for him uh, for going uh, uh, for uh, you know investment into convertible preferred stocks. So finally, the energy industry can be a stable business. Buffett was hoping that it would become even more stable and profitable. In mid-American, Buffett bought fixed income investment with an equity potential. As with all his other investment, he took a characteristic ownership approach and committed himself to the company's growth. So since he, he owns that kind of investment, he is 
totally into the company's affairs and then you know he was uh, paying into you know being close to the management he always used to give a right kind of advices that kept company in a growth path and finally due to growth and uh, better financial performance his wealth as well as company's wealth started growing and blooming so he he had some money off Williams fixed income int uh, instruments while protecting himself with the covenants, high rates and assets. Assets are basically the Barrett resources which we have dealt with uh, the 900 million acquisition. So that was basically backed by the assets of this company. So covenants are nothing but uh, the agreements between uh, the investor and uh, the company. So as it turned out, by mid October uh, 2003, Amer Mid American had grown into a third largest distributor of electricity in United Kingdom and was providing electricity to 6,89,000 people in Iowa, uh, which is an American state, while Kern River and North Northern Natural Pipes carried 7.8 percentage of natural gas in United States of America. This is the quantum, which which uh, we discussed earlier. He that he he put money into this uh, you know acquisition, which is which is tapping Alaskan gas gas reserves. So this is the potential of that you know business, and in total, company had 19 billion of assets and 6 billion in annual revenues from 25 states and several other countries and was yielding Berkshire Hathaway about 300 million per year. It's a huge amount of you know income which is generated by this business apart from capital appreciation. So now uh, what are the uh, final words about a convertible uh, preferred stock which we all have to keep in mind. It is Important to remember that Buffett thinks convertible preferred stocks first as a fixed income security, second as a vehicles for appreciation in case the company uh, a company is doing well and uh, the prices of common stock is increasing. That is the time when he invests to make value for his investment. And uh, always remember this premium uh, the. Uh, premium paid for conversion of these preferred stock will be 20 to 30 percentage. So your investment decision will be only or should be rather only after the appreciation is about 20 or 30 percentage or above the premium what is being paid for such kind of a uh, convertible uh, preferred stock. So hence the value uh, Berkshire's preferred stock cannot be less than the value of similar non-convertible preferred because conversion rights is probably more and Buffett is widely regarded as world's greatest value investor which means which that buying stocks, bonds and other securities and whole companies for a great deal less than their real worth and waiting until the asset value is realized. So whether it is a blue chip stocks or high yield corporate debt, Buffett applies the same principles which we have discussed, those 12 principles. A value investor goes where the deals are. So that is where you need to look at. Although the Buffett is usually thought of as a long term investor in the common stocks, he has capacity, stamina, capital to wade into beleaguered industries and pick out diamonds in the rough. So he chooses specific companies with honest, smart managers and cash generating products. He also chooses instruments that make the most common sense at the time. Usually he has been right and he is not, he admits it. And as it turns out, the decision to move strongly into fixed income in an instrument in 2002 and 2003 was definitely right. That was a time it was a post dot com bust. So the most, most of the market went uh, totally bust. So there were not many ideas or many, many equities or stocks or any businesses that are giving better returns. So that is where he uh, shifted towards uh, common fixed interest uh, instruments. Uh, probably for Indian, in Indian scenario, we haven't reached that stage. 
So once we reach, then these uh, sort of investments will give you a better, uh, you know, invest. Uh, you can say appreciation for the investment you make. In nine, uh, in two thousand, uh, Berkshire's realized gain from uh, uh, fixed income instruments is one billion, whereas in two thousand three, it tripled to two point seven billion. So he has mostly switched over to uh, these kind of investments from equity investments. So now uh, we are coming into a very interesting topic called as psychology of markets. See, uh, uh, see, uh, most of these investment decisions are done by people, people like us. We are all human beings. Human beings behave in a certain irrational way. We hardly find people who are rational, who are logical and who tend to take decisions with a very cool mind because of our you know erratic often contradictory and occasionally goofy nature we tend to make many kind of uh, decisions which are otherwise said to be illogically rational so this you know and uh, the market as we all understand they are all basically a kind of a collective decision taken by all the stock purchasers. It is not an exaggeration to say that psychological forces push and pull the entire market. It's all about psychology. So without understanding the psychology of the market and the psychology of the investors, you are bound to fail as an investor. And investment is more of behavioral, understanding the behavioral science than finance. So you should be good at behavior, understanding behavioral sciences or the psychology. So without understanding about psychology, human psychology and nature, it you cannot prosper as a kind, as a kind, you know, or as an as a, as an investor. So you need to what you have to do. First of all, many times we tend to take decisions which are bad, and at the same time, we don't even know that we have taken such kind of a bad. Decision. Maybe may, the, the reasons, uh, may, maybe we might have overestimated our own uh, self or we have, we are poor at uh, reading the entire stock or uh, the behavior of the markets. So generally we are bound by two kind of emotions, which is one is a greed and the other is fear. And greed and fear are two powerful emotions that run this entire uh, thing called as a stock market. And once we fall victim to either of these two, then naturally we will, you know, uh, later we have to repent for what we did. And uh, always be, you know, contra to these market forces or not, not forces, market emotions or sentiments. So Warren Buffett happened to be one of the most contrarian to the you know popular belief he always uh, he said one powerful quote i think which is most relevant for investors like us one number one is that you be fearful when markets are greedy and you be greedy when the markets are fearful i think this will make you understand it means that when the stocks are falling that is the time for you to purchase when the stocks are booming that is the time when you have to sell so this is the fundamental principle which you have to adopt as an investor then anyone who hopes to participate in uh, in the market uh, must you know uh, allow for impact of emotion it is basically this kind of a thing is too too uh, two sided one you should always be, you have to keep your emotional profile under control. You should not get uh, either too, you know, optimistic, over optimistic or too over pessimistic or too fearful or too greedy. You have to control that first. Second is you have to be alert for those times when investors emotional driven decision present you a golden opportunity like uh, very recently, I took a huge, you know, opportunity when uh, the stocks fell 
by almost 10 percentage you know on 4th of june when the results are out when uh, recently held uh, 2024 general elections in india are out so that is the time i was i i parked some money assuming that you know this uh, i i were i got some information that uh, the fight between both the you know the party in power and opposition is very tight and then uh, i discounted most of the uh, exit polls which are given which has given you know one sided uh, you can say a, a view stating that uh, bjp and its allies will cross uh, 300 plus and it will be somewhere near 400 i discounted that and then on four, on third after the exit polls are out that is the time i decided not to uh, touch uh, the market because it is at its high and i rather sold few of the stocks and then i was keeping parking the money ready for investment so once i got a chance on fourth that is the date in which i took full advantage and invested a good, decent amount of money and within three days after that investment i got back all the money which i have invested so it is based on that opportunity which is presented and and uh, most often we tend to make mistake you know when such kind of opportunity come up we 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 become exuberant we tend to believe trust too much of noises and information given by markets or other players and we need to understand two rules rule number one uh, don't lose money rule number two uh, is never forget rule number one because it's your money and also remember that it is not other people's money purely your money so be very very careful whenever you are investing and in recent years psychologists have turned their attention to how established uh, <laughs> the principles of human behavior play out with the dynamic is money you know and then this blending of economics and psychology is known as behavioral finance and it is just now moving down from the university's ivory towers to become part of informed conversation among investment professionals and who if you look over their shoulders we find the shadow of a smiling ben graham so this behavioral finance have transformed the way in which you know markets are looked at right now and uh, currently because of you know so many changes in technology they there have come uh, technology which is algo trading or algorithmical trading where uh, computers you know they they there uh, some people many a times uh, the people put stop losses and then they put uh, uh, the so called circuits you know they put it high upper circuit or lower circuit and these kind of uh, strategies which are adopted by most of the investors will uh, make uh, the so called uh, uh, the stock market behave very erratic and many times there is high very high volatility within the market and market noises are to be you know taken with caution don't get carried away and now there is always you know there are two kind of people in in the investment community one is called as a investor and a speculator and we need to know the difference between both a speculator is usually a person who anticipate uh, and uh, price movements and try to profit from the price changes and speculators have opposite temperaments compared to investors they are highly anxious impatient irrational and their worst enemy is not the stock market but they themselves because they have very high iq but very low eq they may well have superior abilities in mathematics finance and accounting and they may read they may be excellent you know they may be genius but what they lack is they cannot control their emotions and once any a genius who can't control their emotions they are not at all suitable for investment process so 
you have to you need not be a genius you need not have a very high iq but you should definitely have something called as uh, emo, you know uh, emotional control or high eq eq with above average intelligence is what is needed to be successful as an investor investor seeks only to acquire companies at reasonable prices and the successful investor is often a person who has achieved a certain amount of temperament what is the kind of a temperament an investor should have it is to remain calm patient and rational his notion that uh, true investors can be recognized by their temperament as well as their skills hold true even today so you be very careful to be very successful as an investor you have to keep your temperament even not you know odd tempered you should always be calm patient and rational wait for a right opportunities and then strike having introduced uh, uh, the market uh, psychology uh now we we now have to see what are the characteristics of uh, the investors and uh, the true investors so the first character of every uh, any uh, true investor is that they are calm and uh, they know that the prices are influenced by forces both reasonable and unreasonable and the markets keep falling and rising and that includes even the stocks they own when that happens they react with equanimity they know that as long as the company retains the qualities that attracted them as investors in the first place the price will come back in the meantime they do not panic the meaning of this is say uh, you are uh, an investor you as an investor you have to be very very calm and quiet and you should understand that the stock prices are moved by the forces which are both reasonable as well as unreasonable and the stocks keep you know fluctuating uh, between uh, the rises and falls and uh, you should be equanimous you know you should take both rise and fall as something which is normal not abnormal and they should they always continue invested in those companies which they are attracted towards because they know that the company is still attractive whereas that whatever the fall in the prices will come back in time to come and they do not panic at all so this is very important and regarding this buffett said one thing you know if you are an investor you are known as investor only when you know you can accept uh, and you can see your stock fall 50 percentage without being panicked so you should not get panic and if you can see that then you are said to be an investor if you can't that sorry investment is not your cup of tea so you better either uh, uh, quit investing or you improve your you know uh, patience and ability to stay calm in any kind of fluctuations or any kind of market mayhem or blood bath so in fact as long as you feel good about the businesses you own you should welcome lower prices as a way of profitably increasing your holdings what you should do say a price has fallen say 40 50 or 30 whatever percentage what will you do will you sell or will you buy uh, an investor will always buy when the prices are low so ideally you should invest keep on investing when the prices are falling rather than selling them at the opposite end of the spectrum true investors are also remain calm in the face of what might might call mob influence when one stock or industry or a mutual fund suddenly lands in the spotlight and mob rushes in that direction and 
this will lead to sudden rush towards a particular uh, stock or even industry and that lead to a huge amount of bull run. That rally of stocks, you should not get, you know, perturbed into it and don't be in a mad rush of putting a lot of money because these are all temporary and at later stage it may fall. The trouble is when everyone is making the same choices because everyone knows it's the thing to do and then no one is in a position to profit. If everybody thinks that yes, this particular stock is going to grow, then everybody keep on putting money and it, it keeps growing and then where, where is that you are making money? It is not the everyone. As I have discussed in the initial, you know, a uh, few uh, couple of uh, lectures that unless there is a chasm, chasm is a time when any particular investment idea or a company or a stock or an idea or an invention, when they are, you know, adopted by the so-called most of the majority of the society, only when vast majority of the society adopts it, that is a stage when it starts moving. So you need to understand that only then you have to put your money into such kind of businesses if you want to take full advantage. And once the, 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 the stock has appreciated so much, there is no point putting into it. You might have seen uh, some particular stock in the recent past, like I think we all have seen that many people, uh, there is a, a very big news article that has come that, you know, Chandra Babu Naidu's stock, uh, the, the family has earned around 800 plus crores in their company called as Heritage Foods in last five or seven, uh, six sessions. So uh, there is no point, you know, uh, putting money into a stock which has appreciated some 40 or 50 percentage right now because it has already appreciated more than it's due and never invest into such kind of a thing because it has come into news and you are anticipating that you will profit by uh, seeing it grow even further and many a times it may, ha may not happen so. So ultimately you land up, you know, once you put your money and uh, then uh, there will be this, uh, the so-called whatever bubble is that gets bust and you as an investor, you lose your money. So better avoid such kind of a mad rush and be away from such kind of stocks whenever they were very hot, you know. And true investors do not worry about missing the party. They worry about coming the party unprepared. So don't worry that you are missing the bus or missing the party or the missing the fun. So these kind of, uh, you know, buses will or the opportunities you, you will keep on getting in time to come and better be prepared rather than be totally unprepared to take on. When you are unprepared, better you drop. Don't, don't uh, pursue any further. Then the second characteristic of a uh, true investor is they are patient. Patience is the hallmark of the true investors. Instead of being swept along with enthusiasm of the crowd, true investors wait for the right opportunity. They say no more often than yes. So recently I got an offer uh, related to, you know, a particular investment from a few of the friends. So who happened to be very close and then they were assuring that uh, you put an investment into it, put an horizon of one or two or three years, then this particular stock may grow. Then I asked some questions, you know, what is the, you know, performance of that company, how it is doing, what is the profit margins, is it growing and uh, what is the uh, kind of, you know, segment and all. Uh, and then I I got a very vague kind of uh, answers. Then I said, okay, let me go through the website. Then uh, let me, uh, later I'll take a call. So I downloaded somewhere around 10 years uh, uh, annual reports of that company. And I was seeing to my surprise that company's revenue started falling uh, since the last uh, seven or eight years continuously and it is now into loss making, you know, losses. And then uh, 
I don't know. Then I asked him another question also prior to, he said, I asked, why is that gentleman selling that now? What is the reason for sale? When you are anticipating that the company is growing, why will he sell it? So these are the kind of questions you keep on, you have to keep putting. And you need to be wary that, as I said, there are only two rules. Rule number one, uh, never lose money. Rule number two, do not forget rule number one. And also remember that it is your money. Also, and also it is not other people's money. So you be very, very careful about your money. So uh, Buffett believes that too many of today's, you know, investors feel a need to purchase too many stocks, most of which are certain to be mediocre instead of waiting for few exceptional companies. This is his belief. But again, I generally do not follow this principle because uh, India is an emerging market and uh, uh, Warren Buffett is averse to technology and it is the technology which is driving US markets and the world and they are growing. These are called as a growth stocks. And the principles he has uh, propounded or the 12 principles which we have discussed, they do well when it comes to value investing. Value investing is when the, 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 the companies are in a stable kind of a, you know, uh, industry which has come to some stage, uh, somewhat like, you know, maturity or late, uh, you can say, growth stage, really late growth and early maturity. That is where you can adopt such kind of principles. And then it is all, you know, it is about your personal comfort. Like if you are comfortable with only five or ten companies, better go for that. Rather than having uh, too many uh, stocks into your portfolio. Like to reinforce Graham's lesson, Buffett often uses analogy of punch card. An investor, he says, should act. Uh, as though he had a lifetime decision card with just 20 punches on it. With every decision, uh, his card is punched. And as he has one fewer available for the rest of the life. So this is what is, uh, uh, you know, quote, or rather the fundamental. However, uh, if you see, uh, based on the case study, which we have uh, dealt with uh, uh, Graham, uh, sorry, uh, Warren Buffett's life study. Uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, he, he has uh, invested many times in many multiple companies. And it's not that he has done only 20 uh, investments. This is at the latest stage when the American markets are getting matured. And when uh, the ideas, uh, investment ideas are becoming very fewer, rarer, and he's not getting right kind of, you know, investments. That is where he had to abandon that particular thing. So in any case, uh, we, 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 we need not, you know, uh, either we can follow or we need not. That is purely left out to you based on your own personal comfort and your own strategies and your understanding. And then uh, if investors were restrained in this way, Buffett figures that they would be forced to wait patiently until great opportunity surfaced. See, this is a way of saying that you you assume like that and then you try to take a decision which where you get a wonderful opportunity. So wait for such kind of an opportunity. This is what is the message he wanted to convey through this, you know, uh, analogy. Now, uh, the next one is very important, which we all have to understand. The true investors are are rational what is uh, uh, and then uh, they approach the market and the world from a very base of clear thinking like being rational means you you are uh, your thought process is not clogged clogged by anything like as we have initially discussed in the first sessions what influences your thought process apart from education it is uh, you know, uh, one is uh, the religion or your society influences you in such a, uh, in a particular way. Many a time your irrationalities are corrupted because of those things or 
the so called your your understandings or your inhibitions or your your so called limitations in your thought process that inhibits you from taking any kind of a rational decision this is one number 2 is when you as an investor tend to be very very emotional or driven by passions and emotions and sentiments that is where we tend to behave very irrational so usually a rational thinker or a rational investor are neither unduly pessimistic or irrationally optimistic they are basically logical and reasonable uh, rational so what do we mean by this they they are bound by they are they take informations uh, sorry decisions based on information right kind of information not based on some hearsay or some some tip from somebody and unverified information you have to take informed decisions based on a genuine information in the markets you find most often a lot of you know uh, uh, so called uh, uh, fake news or misinformation which is spread because these days we are all victims of uh, fake news and also misinformation and it became an industry for many of those people who wanted to spread such kind of a thing for their own personal benefit and you most often you find this even in the investment world especially it can be you know by uh, a kind of a media group or some social media groups or even the investors themselves or some analysts and all these kind of a thing they tend to sell a particular information and every information you should be rational enough to discount you should know how to discount those such kind of information unless you apply certain principles or the rules you know there are four rules of identifying how to Uh, you know identify whether it is fake or correct first rule is a uh, rule of veracity you have to see whether whatever the information which is given by any party is it correct or wrong is it factually correct or factually incorrect how do you find it see uh, many a times you you get to have uh, information either through you know going through right right now we have a lot of access to in, in for internet so you just go search in google find out the sources find out whether it is true or not many a times there are even some uh, sites which will give you which uh, which does the fact finding analysis and uh, get into it and most often the most genuine information will be from the company itself go to the company's website go through their you know or annual reports or uh, the news which is uh, uh, given by uh, or broadcasted by their own uh, uh, companies and also this is one this is the first source first source is always the primary source uh, the company itself or or uh, even uh, the newspaper reports newspaper also is one of the major you know stream of information which you can get many times which i observe uh, the so called um, uh, television channels or all these kind of things many a times they keep on you know may not be presenting the entire of the facts or even if because of the limitation of the time and uh, they don't have enough uh, you know uh, because there is too much of information available and they have to uh, communicate within the too limited time so many a times they cherry pick only certain specific kind of a news and uh, that news which you as a, a consumer if you can consume the such kind of news maybe that may not be as per your requirement so better is to go through uh, the so called print media still the the print especially the reputed uh, genuine newspapers they keep on giving you good kind of information so go through make a detailed analysis thorough understanding understand what exactly it is see uh, the more you verify it when most of the sources which you verify gives you the same information naturally it is said to be the correct one if 
maybe even uh, at times we may get baffled because many a times these all these so called fake uh, uh, propagandists what they do is they tend to spread the same fake news through various channels and finally we tend to believe that that is a true picture but may not be true because many a times we tend to believe because they are coming from multiple sources we we tend to believe it and in that also we need to apply certain uh, you know a few more tests which i'll be communicating at later stage then the second test is like you can go to any expert maybe you if you have access to uh, the management or somebody working in within that community co company so you can keep asking is this true what is the to what extent this kind of information is true or else as uh, uh, philip fisher said you have to do something called as scuttlebutting scuttlebutting is a technique where you interact with so many of the stakeholders of the company stakeholders who are the stakeholders of the company the employees of the company the competitors the supply chain uh, within the company maybe raw material providers uh, vendors their uh, uh, you know consumers their distributors all these set of people they all tend to have some information related to that particular you know company product or anything and many a times the insider information is or uh, the correct information is available from the people who are within the company so this is another mm, third source of information is related to your uh, you know mm, uh, so called uh, experts many a times experts tend to being in that particular field they tend to give you a right kind of a picture right kind of a, uh, you know understanding about it so uh, and uh, they 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 have the analytical bent of mind and they they do their they have so much of information backing knowledge in depth analysis so they help you to give you a right kind of information then uh, the third one is uh, the next one is uh, you know following some other literature which which are like some reports or some uh, detailed study conducted by some uh, you know some uh, you can say researcher or analyst that also gives you a kind of information and then the after this the second test is related to test of uh, you know after veracity it is about test of uh, 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 objectivity and subjectivity see many a times we tend to see a particular message and all these lies are too true to be believed if you apply the logic you will see you can understand whether it is a fact based or opinion based anything fact based is objective like there can be only one fact there cannot be 100 facts and when it comes to opinions or lies there can be hundreds of opinion thousands of opinion or thousands of lies you know so lies are plenty whereas fact is only one so if you can see the way in which it is worded you will understand whether it is an opinion or whether it is a fact so if you have the power to discern uh, whether that is you know factually correct or it is it sounds more like opinion then definitely you know that is a time that that test is to be applied by you and that needs a, a great amount of understanding and you should be basically an expert in you know dealing with such kind of a things this comes with experience and with this comes with your cognitive uh, you can say analytical mind if you are, if you have an analytical bent of mind and you break every source of information every information into smaller parts and try to understand what it means and how far you you keep on questioning you know all that six questions why when where how what which so this will give that will lead you to you know finding out whether whatever is being communicated is right or wrong then uh, the third test is related to test of uh, you know relevance so is this information relevant to you or to your investment see many times we tend to waste most of our time reading something which is unwanted irrelevant to us 
to our investment we tend to take it you know many a times which i have seen of late is mostly whosoever are peddling lies or information they go into such a micro details which are very very highly irrelevant for any of these decision makings they focus on micros so that they 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 tend to you know build a narrative that narrative many a times are not at all you know if you see if you put a broader uh, framework or if you keep questioning whether it is hitting at broadly you know uh, say something like whether is it is that particular information hitting at something related to the top line of the business or the bottom line of the business or uh, the market penetration are they losing to their competitors are they delivering any kind of products or the segments which they are into uh, are they uh, is it hitting at their business model and so on and so forth these are the fundamental things which you always have to keep uh, you know questioning if you see this kind of information many a times those information are highly irrelevant if at all it has any relevance the impact of such kind of, kind of uh, uh, news or information will be very 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 low on your uh, investment so better discard such kind of invest uh, information the moment you get to have such kind of information then uh, the fourth test is test of validity is that particular information valid Uh, or uh, in all you know uh, circumstances under all circumstances many a times people tend to put such kind of things which are which are not valid every time you know as an individual they will say you as an investor they will try to sell off something which is too true to believe and you if you they because they they tend to address to your emotions they tend to make you feel as if you know there is if you don't put such kind of investment then you will totally miss out uh, the entire of the bus see i have seen these kind of pitching previously i used to have certain newsletters of us investments so few of the investors even in indian investors also analysts you know they claim they themselves having some 25 30 or 40 years of experience and they have identified x share which has grown 20 times or 30 times 100 times and then they say that yes at that time if you have they always try to give you a pitch that they they try to address certain thing which has really happened like you know when it comes to investment they will always say had you invested into uh you know the so called mr of tire at uh, so and so time when it is 6000 or 7000 today to it is now 3 lakh something like that you know and all these kind of stories they keep on saying now we have identified uh, such kind of a example and certain segment industry which is you know bound to increase or something like they will give you uh, detail about uh, all those it companies which like uh, may maybe microsoft or even uh, facebook your uh, tesla all these companies they will try to give uh, you examples and then they try to pitch in that you know uh, they you had you uh, uh, invested at this uh, 10 years ago you would have got this much of returns and all that stuff so nobody has seen future so you need to understand it no one can predict anything but yes you can understand certain trend, trends which are going on so what is important and uh, uh, relevant over here is see whether those things are valid every time or not and don't try to you know jump to a conclusion and fall to that particular pitch and try to invest and that is a time where you will make wrong decisions so behave rationally and also many a times you know like uh, warren buffett initially he did something called as uh, cigarette butt strategy what is that strategy is he was he was interested which we all do you know into some set particular penny stocks whose uh, a value or the asset value is more than that of the price of that particular thing 
assuming that even I did a lot of mistakes identifying companies which are penny stocks and assuming that if they grow a one rupee stock even if it uh, grows say into 10 rupees which is possible now without going into the fundamentals with uh, what we tend to assume is we tend to become irrational with all optimistic over optimistic uh, 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 you know assumptions and finally we we'll end up losing that money so uh, ladies and gentlemen be very wary of such kind of you know mistakes we tend to do and then uh, if they go to the next step and put feelings into action then what do you do you sell at a lower prices and buy at higher prices is that good for you you have purchased a particular stock say at a very high price and then for example i committed uh, two blunders uh, when it comes to alok industries i purchased initially at 7 it kept on going up to 40 41 and then i kept on acquiring at a very high price and later my uh, acquisition price became 34 rupees and whereas the, 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 that particular stock fell to 10 12 rupees at the later stage and that was a company which is going into continuous losses alok industries once it was a very uh, excellent uh, well run company with one of the highest uh, you know manufacturing capacity compared to the textiles so compared to its competitors but of late it started you know because of uh, unfavorable economic winds so it started faltering it went on into bankruptcy finally that is the time when uh, dhirubhai uh, mukesh ambani has purchased that stock that stock was purchased at um, you know uh, he he purchased uh, for a discounted value of 80 percentage to the actual value of that particular company and then uh, we all tend to think that oh it is purchased by Mukesh Ambani so that company might grow and it will give a very decent uh, profits and a company valued 40 rupees may go to the two, zero, two digit three digit or you know I was even assuming that it may become four digit company but for my surprise even after three four years of wheat also that company was continuously uh, booking losses and i was very surprised and i was waiting finally i had to sell for a huge loss similar thing happened even with uh, one more investment into capital the so-called uh, future group uh, kishore biani's group once it had been uh, a very huge success story and later because of uh, you can say a bad financial management or over optimistic uh, assumptions about the growth of the company he failed he faltered and then he became uh, uh, you know bankrupt finally almost the company went on for winding and that is where it led to uh, a kind of a you know purchase by again Mukesh Ambani uh, with uh, the board uh, resolution to purchase the entire company, the entire group for around 25,000 crores. So that is again, I, I again invested assuming that uh, uh, Ambani's have a huge amount of reputation of turning everything into gold and uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, enriched their own investors. So I took a very wrong decision even at that time i was assuming that yes this company is bound to grow and then let this is the right time to invest now or never so again i invested huge amount of money then uh, to my surprise and we all know that uh, there was a kind of a legal battle between uh, uh, amazon and uh, uh, the so-called Kishore Biani. so finally because he being one of the uh, creator to that company he was not being made aware of the uh, you know uh, deal between him and uh, Dhirubhai Ambani later it went to court and uh, during uh, due to that uh, you know legal battle and in the meantime because that the deal was not going on the Mukesh Ambani has given a kind of a uh, 
you know, uh, notice to this guy to repay the entire debt or the money which is he has promised because he has already purchased some of the properties which he had in many good uh, cities in the, you know, the country. So prime properties are being put on uh, mortgage. So what he did is he has, because he has failed to honor that particular commitment he has taken on uh, 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 in rather he has uh, uh, confiscated those properties and assets and finally this entire future group got collapsed and uh, me being investor almost uh, the whatever i have invested i had to come out with uh, 95 90 to 95% uh, losses Finally, I came out of that company. So this is where we tend to be irrational because we tend to be too too much optimistic. Optimism is nowhere good. So never adopt such kind of a strategy. Always go for companies which are highly reputed. Their managers are good and they are in a favorable, you know, business, long term business. Uh, then you have to see uh, the kind of uh, decision making by the managers are they rational are they <laughs> you know avoiding or resisting the so called temptation to take certain costly decisions and are they honest whenever when it comes to uh, you know disclosing facts uh, especially when things are not going well so and then you have to see whether you get you generate enough ROE and or ROC return over capital uh, uh, you know employed in case of India because we are all majorly driven by banking US is basically driven by equities so over there the most famous thing is ROE return over equity so and then what are the profit margins whether they are uh, trying to reduce the debt so that the cost to the company is getting reduced uh, or the fixed uh, so-called liabilities and then these kind of a things you have to look into uh, while taking any kind of a decision then uh, don't indulge in, into any kind of uh, you know actions that lead you to lose your money undue optimism rare it uh, rears its head when the investors assume that somehow the fate will smile on them and their stock will will be one in hundred that take off okay this this is what happened especially with me when it comes to the decisions i have taken related to um, the so called uh, uh, future group and alok industries when Mukesh Ambani has taken over it so never think there is nothing called as a fate everything is you know your own decisions rationality prevails irrationality will fail so you be you take a very rational decision not something irrational illogical and uh, not based on facts take a f informed decision rather than uninformed and uh, or passionate or moving by you know your uh, over optimism optimism or uh, unduly pessimistic uh, thoughts you know many a times we miss great opportunities just because we are very pessimistic about a particular company and later we repent why did we why didn't we purchase when that option and opportunity has come so Always apply the principles which we have discussed, those 12 principles. And those 12 principles are the founding pillars for any of your managerial or information decisions. And it is also like, you know, especially these kind of behavior is prevalent in bull markets when the expectations are very, very high. And most people see the problem is we all fail or indeed we lose money during bull markets not during bear markets bear markets are 
always safe you know they are the safest always invest in bear markets and sell during bull markets you have to be contrarian to the market expectations or market sentiments and never never fall prey to the sentiments these markets behave so because those you know ace investors or the so called punters or the so called unscrupulous uh, you can say speculators they want you to lose money and they want to make money at your own cost at your cost so as i said you have to apply two rules so ultimately it's your money so be very rational to protect yourself you should be rational and optimist see no need to do fundamental research and analysis that would illuminate the real long winners finding few keepers all the uh, all look uh, like you know like dot com businesses because the short term numbers are so seductive see what usually happen is when you are in optimism you tend not to go through any kind of a fundamental research what is a fundamental research fundamental research is basically you are looking into a company studying it based on its annual reports financial statements try to analyze try to understand whenever there are gaps in you know information that is where you need to keep pondering why there is a gap in information any company which is giving you true and fair picture of anything their entire thing is very it's like a you know a clean slate so everything seems to be very good everything on uh, there is all the dots are properly connected there is no information which is missing nothing something you know incredible or unbelievable thing which is being put into such kind of a thing they they you find uh, uh, the information to be factually correct and there will there is always a you know flow of thought flow of information connecting each and everything and whenever such kind of information gaps are there that means that is the areas where you need to look at and the more you read the fundamentals of that particular company you tend to you know get more information and recently there was iifl iifl which fell down because uh, say, uh, rbi has put uh, restrictions on them going for gold loans so all of a sudden the entire market collapsed it went so down so down that the company hit somewhere around 35 to 40 percentage whereas the gold loan business of the entire company is just only 30 percentage or 34 percentage i thought yes market has hit it or discounted this entire information enough and then uh, that was a time when i wanted to purchase on a particular date when it was you know hit then i decided what if this is the fall is even steep then i sold it immediately and then i was waiting so on fourth that was the time since i have already gone through their uh, balance sheets and also the company is growing at a cagr of 21 percentage which is quite impressive given the conditions market conditions in india so i thought yes this is a very good company and it is continuously growing with a good amount of decent you know uh, profit margins so i immediately invested on fourth when uh, every stock was hit this was also hit that is the time i invested some money into it so that is how you no know, i was identifying certain good companies and then um, finding few keepers yeah yes many a times what happens is especially during uh, initial stages of growth when the regulations are very less Uh, uh the companies you know tend to grow very fast some companies will grow abnormally very high so in such a scenario 
uh, we always tend to assume that yes every company is good they're all growing because the numbers are growing uh, especially like when it comes to dot com businesses now nowadays it is unicorn you know unicorns in india all the so called startups so in the startups i was very you know going through them and then i found most of the business models are very vulnerable and they are very very irrationally or insanely uh, valued and the valuations are not at all true and uh, they don't have so much of space bandwidth left out so i never invested into them except for recently i have invested uh, you know into two one is uh, zomato zomato i have invested only after it started reporting profit and from there i got decent amount of you know uh so called profits then there was another company paytm paytm i have purchased when that you know initially that uh, rbi has regulated its uh, payment bank and all that stuff so that is the when i invested it went on it is still in negative but yes it's okay some day it will come up because that business model is quite robust and uh, that is an excellent uh, you know you can say uh, model because the transaction the entire of the fee is based on the transactions so the number of transactions to paytm are increasing and because uh, uh, the so called uh, online the so called uh, you know upi payments became uh, very much uh, quite popular and every nowadays everybody is uh, involved or rather doing such kind of uh, payments so i think uh, since they get uh, some uh, fixed charges or uh, some amount so that is what uh, keeps on this company sticking and this is a very robust kind of a model so that is the reason why i have invested into paytm uh, though it is right now it's around uh, 35 percentage on uh, bottom side or red uh, so still i'm still hooking on to it because i'm anticipating in future to come things will improve so the next one is undue pessimism when directed at one company or market in general motivates investor to sell at exactly wrong time say this is very very one of the most worst things which you tend to do see many a times you know some company will be hit or going through a bad phase see all the businesses are not Uh, uh you can say they are not evenly growing there are many times they move through rough patches or rough uh, phases in their history so that you know many times uh, uh, due to certain circumstances they become victim and then that is the time when once a company is hit everybody will start saying that yes this is the time you have to quit this uh, companies and there is no point you know and uh, you your investment may fall further like we have uh, dealt with uh, a few of the case studies especially like uh, your uh, uh, be it coca cola or uh, the so called washington post or even uh, the other one is uh, what is that american express you know american express cards because of the fraud that company's uh, share fell down by 50 percentage and when warren buffett has uh, you know was moving from his office to or rather home to his office he observed that uh, nobody no one is bothered about the scandal everybody left and right they are using american express cards so he got a trust that yes despite uh, being falling so much percentage still it did not dent in the minds of uh, the users or the customers as long as customers are all having uh, so much of faith in the company Uh, there is no point that company will not come back again so immediately what he did is he immediately rushed to his office he purchased a huge amount of you know around 30 percentage of his money 30 to 40 percentage of whatever the uh, money his company was holding he put entire of the money and within short time he got recovered whatever the investment he made and plus he made huge amount of profits so 
you need to understand that whenever any such kind of you know pessimism is there in the market regarding a particular company or the general market that is a time when you need to rethink don't be overly undue optimistic pessimistic and rather you have to see to what extent it will impact uh, the company and whether this will be uh, you know hit in the really wrong run you have to do a lot of analysis you know, behind before you take any kind of a decision so this is uh, in nutshell about this uh, you know uh, uh, rationality and then uh, we will discuss uh, rest of the things at the later stage because uh, last session uh, this online session i have stopped at this particular slide so we can continue rest of the things related to you know behavioral finance where do we we make mistakes and then the psychology what we should do how we should uh, uh, you know keep on these kind of a things we will discuss at the later stage this is a very interesting topic like you know uh, what we should do as an investors and uh, a true investors are always you know calm they are patient and then they are rational these are the three things and uh, the so called uh, 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 speculators are those people who are highly anxious impatient and irrational so you should not be a speculator rather you should be an investor be an investor forever remain as an investor and we being working professionals we cannot do speculation and speculation is not our forte because that is for only those people who are 24 by 7 are in glue to the markets they, they keep taking market information they keep you know getting all the tips information all the news and then they decipher they analyze they keep running something called as uh, what do you call a technical analysis and all those charts so that is for those kind of a people for investors it is always the fundamental research and then having a solid understanding about the fundamentals of the business the companies so in nutshell this is it for today and for this session so guys we will meet again next week and in fact indeed uh, next as i said in the past like Uh, for the next one month, I'll be busy preparing for my examinations. Uh, I'm I'm just giving MSc in geography, and uh, for the information of all the viewers, uh, those people who are preparing for CMA, I'm going to start uh, sessions related to it after post my examinations. I cover one topic by topic and chapter by chapter, so that uh, you know people who say were are they can uh, refresh their. you know information and knowledge about those uh, uh, areas and uh, i wish uh, you people you know uh, good luck and also to subscribe to my channel and also view all the videos which i'll be posting and mostly it will be informative uh, regarding investment later i'm thinking of you know publishing some more Uh, the so called uh, 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 what what do you call uh, information and uh, uh, this thing related to uh, what do you call uh, education skills and uh, also about uh, you know study abroad all these things i'll be covering slowly but steadily uh, these are the areas which i would be liking to take it so thank you guys thanks and we will meet uh, again uh, after a month thank you